afternoon. Thank you for coming. Today's talk by Brad Seligman is the third presentation in this year's Public Interest Law and Policy Speaker Series. This talk is co-sponsored by the Center for the Interdisciplinary Study of Work and Social Capital and the American Constitution Society Student Chapter. I'm Karen Tokar, a professor here at the law school and the director of the Dispute Resolution Program and one of the coordinators for the Public Interest Law and Policy Speaker Series. One of the chief goals of this annual speaker series is to bring to the law school and to the university some of the country's top public interest lawyers, nationally recognized lawyers like Brad Seligman, who are undertaking tough public interest law and policy issues on the ground. We invite them to campus, to the law school, to engage us in an interdisciplinary discussion of the tough issues that impact access to justice in our country. Brad Seligman is a nationally recognized civil rights lawyer and class action expert. He's engaged in complex litigation for 30 years. He's also the founder and longtime executive director of the Impact Fund, which provides, as some of you may know, strategic leadership and support for impact litigation focused on civil rights, on economic justice, and on poverty law. And they offer a wide range of resources. They offer innovative technical support, training expertise on large, large, large scale litigation as lead counsel, co-counsel, and amicus counsel. Brad has successfully litigated over 50 civil rights class actions, countless individual actions. Most recently, he was the lead counsel in the nationwide class action gender discrimination case, Dukes v. Walmart, the largest civil rights class ever certified and decertified. <laughs> In his talk today, he will share with us his thoughts on what the Walmart case means for the future civil rights class action cases. Please join me in welcoming certainly one of the country's top public interest lawyers, Brad Seligman. Thank you. Am I on? Yeah. Hi. Uh, it's a pleasure being here. Uh, I have to tell you the story about this case, but it starts with Betty Dukes, who was a, uh, a cashier and then later a greeter, still is to this day, at Walmart in Pittsburgh, California. Uh, but as Betty tells it, when she joined this case uh, in June of 2001, the case was called Dukes versus Walmart. And Betty was one of six plaintiffs in the case. At that point, she'd been working at Walmart for nine years and was making $8.40 an hour, which is a high wage mainly because California is, uh, had a higher economy. If she was working in some other places, she probably would have gotten paid less. The case litigated for 10 years, and uh, this summer, uh, the Supreme Court reversed the decision of the District Court and the Ninth Circuit and the Ninth Circuit and Bank Panel certifying the class. And as Betty would have it, the case started out as Dukes versus Walmart, but by the time I got to the Supreme Court, it became Walmart versus Dukes. Uh, and that's one of the stories about them, why we do these kinds of cases. The average worker at Walmart uh, had a loss of, uh, resulting in denial of equal pay, of probably about $1,100 a year, which if you're making $12,000 to $15,000 a year, is pretty astronomical, but it's not enough money not enough loss to generally get you a lawyer to bring your case. And for the Betty Dukes of the world, uh, the only option, in her view, and I think in mine also, in terms of trying to deal with the systemic problem, was to bring a class action. So let me tell you a little bit how this case got to where it got, and what the Supreme Court did to it, and what her options are. One of the good things about being a, uh, uh, a lawyer for 30 years, which is kind of a scary, fright frightening thing to me, is there have been some very bad Supreme Court years. This is one of them. It's not the only one. Uh, I'm, I've been around long enough to remember that in 1989, the Supreme Court, then the Rehnquist Court, issued a series of six decisions which, which appeared to have dismantled uh, most of the civil rights statutes in the country. Two years later, Congress reversed most of it, and not only reversed it, but expanded the remedies under Title VII. So I'm eternally hopeful. Um, the other thing I like to remind myself of is here I am in this modern class action era uh, that when the uh, Legal Defense Fund, uh, led by Thurgood Marshall, was litigating Brown versus the board, they were operating under an era 
under an older civil rights class action law, which was almost completely toothless. And they still managed to certify Brown and four other cases and go all the way to the Supreme Court. So it gives me hope, no matter how bad it looks. So let me tell you a little bit what the facts are and how Walmart uh, got to where it was. The facts at Walmart are pretty straightforward. How many people have been in a Walmart? Yeah, every Walmart looks alike, don't they? And the reason they all look alike is because Walmart is an incredibly centralized, uniform entity. Every store looks alike. Bentonville, Arkansas, uh, which is, uh, uh, I was going to say a gorgeous town, maybe I won't say that. Uh, an interesting town uh, is where all major decisions are, all the way down to the temperature of the, of the Walmart and the music that they play, but more importantly, uh, the staffing ratios, uh, the pay levels, everything comes from Bentonville. Uh, they have a, an elaborate system of command and control such that if they think, just to use one example, that there is a potential union problem at one store, within 24 hours, literally a flying squad is there from Bentonville and take over the whole store to make sure the problem won't happen. Uh, they have state-of-art uh, IT, so they know exactly what's going on out there. So they knew what was going on about pay. They knew what was going on about promotion. And it is a good old boy company. It started back in the 70s. Uh, at the highest level of the company, uh, it's a company where men are, have been long in charge and women, particularly the employees, were referred to at times as little Janie Qs or girls and things like that. So it is a very old school, very insular company. So what are the issues that were rose in our case? We had two, two basic issues. Uh, the first, which actually was the original issue that came to my attention, was the problem with promotion, that women were not getting promoted up the, up the line. Uh, the main entry, Walmart has a lot of hourly jobs, and I'll show you that pyramid in a moment, but the main entry is the management trainee position. The um, decision about whether you're going to management trainee was made at the district and regional level of the company. Uh, there was no objective requirements for getting to that other than the most minimal, you, know, you have to work there for a year and have a high school degree. Um, there was a tradition in the company that if you want to go into management, you have to be willing to relocate uh, repeatedly around the country. Uh, something that even Sam Walton, the founder of the company, later admitted disadvantaged a lot of women who had family responsibilities. Uh, the pay practices uh, for the hourly employees uh, had, had a level of discretion built into it. Basically, a store manager or a district manager could pay you within a pretty broad range based on no documentation or, or nothing. Uh, there was a lot of pressure to keep the pay down low, but you could reward people if you wanted to. The pay reports, though, if you did report, reward people and pay them above basic levels, there were reports that went up the line to the district and the regional managers. And the evidence showed that, in fact, women were paid less than men in every job, in every region of the company. So that's the basic facts. What are the job positions? The, the most important position for our case was the district manager, who was in charge of about six to eight stores. Reporting to him is the store manager who is sort of like the princeling of the realm. The store manager has enormous power over his employees. Some of the larger stores had what are called co-managers, and then every store had a number of assistant managers. Uh, below them, though, the vast bulk of the employees uh, are going to be hourly employees, cashiers, card pushers, greeters, stockers, and sales workers. That's who did most of the work in the, in the company. Uh, what is that? pyramid look like? And I use the word pyramid because that is exactly what it is. I actually like to say that Walmart, you could describe their workforce actually as a star of David. Because like that is what women look like. They're very wide at the bottom and as you go up the ranks it goes like that. And if you flip that over, it's exactly the opposite for the men. Lots of men at the top, fewer women at the bottom. Women are more than two-thirds of the hourly employees and one-third of the managers. Reverse those figures, you have exactly what it looks like uh, for the men. Now, here's what the actual percentages look like as you go up the level. CSM is a cashier. Women are 90% of the cashiers. The department managers are hourly paid, and women do very well getting up to that job. They have almost 80% of those jobs. But once you get past that, look at what happens to the numbers. Women basically disappear, getting down to 14% for store managers. Um, you wonder why that might have happened. Well, Walmart had no system to get into management. 
There was not an application process. There was not a bidding process. Basically what happened is that all-powerful district manager, hand would come out of the sky, and he would see in the Sistine Chapel the picture of God reaching down to Adam, come down and will tap you on the shoulder. You're the next management trainee. And that was the system. The district managers were mostly women, excuse me, were mostly men, and so were their selections, were mostly men. So how does Walmart compare to its competitors? Because Walmart might say, well, women just aren't interested in these jobs anywhere else. We had a study done where we compared Walmart to its 20 largest competitors about the percentage of women in management. And what you'll find, here's Walmart in the bottom, and there's the competitors at the top, is Walmart is way, way, way behind the average. Walmart has about a third of their managers are women and their competitors on average, and these are the, the Targets, the Kmarts, whatever, uh, have over 55% female. But the figure which really jumps out at me, you've got to look at this chart carefully. This is 1999. If you draw a line here and go all the way back to 1975, Walmart in 1999 had less women in management than their competitors had in 1975. It's kind of like the women's movement, the integration of the labor force never happened at Walmart. Here's what the pay chart looks like. At every single job up the line, women get paid less than men at Walmart. Uh, starting from the lowly cashier up to the regional vice president. The difference can be quite large. Uh, it doesn't look that big at lower level jobs because they don't pay very well. You know, in 2001, your average uh, female uh, cashier was making less than $14,000 a year. So they're not well-paying job, but there was like a tax. The women pay, were paid 5 to 15 percent less than the guys, and that was the way it looked at. Well, that, what I showed you are sort of basic raw numbers, and one could say, well, numbers, averages, they don't tell you enough information. You really want to know uh, if the numbers reveal a meaningful pattern. And there might be some non-discriminatory explanations, like women might get paid less than guys because they're not as good as employee or because they don't have as much seniority. Or they might not get promoted because they're not as qualified uh, as the men or they're not in the right jobs. So we do statistical analysis to see if those averages suggest actually something that, that might be discriminatory. So we had two kinds of statistical analysis. For promotions, we did what is called a pool analysis. We looked at the employees that were in the pool that fed into promotion positions. Since Walmart had virtually no qualifications or objective minimum qualifications, the presumption was everyone in that pool was eligible to be promoted. And if you did that, you looked at the pool versus the promotion rate, what you find is that women got about 50% less promotions than you would have expected in a non-discriminatory system. The pay was a little bit more sophisticated. Because for pay, we had some objective data. Even though Walmart had no standards, you could ask yourself some questions about employees. Uh, can we rule out seniority as a factor? Can we rule out performance as a factor? Can we rule out job title or other factors that might explain your pay differences? So our statisticians did a fairly sophisticated analysis called a multiple regression analysis where you hold, essentially, you look at the pay levels of, of men and women and you take into account those objective factors, hold them constant and say among similarly situated people, is there a pay difference even after you take into account the store, the job, the, pay le the seniority, the performance, uh, and those kinds of factors. Um, that was the multiple regression analysis. Now, we made the assumption that since this was a nationwide policy and, an, and it was a nationwide pattern, our regressions were done at the national level, but we also looked at whether the regressions would yield a different result in each of the 41 different regions of Walmart. And so what the regression showed was in every single region, women were paid less than men even after you took into account all the objective factors that we could identify. So, and, and the reason for that is very simple is, ironically, and all the women in here know the answer to this, of course, amazingly, the women at Walmart were better employees than the guys. They had more seniority, they had better performance ratings, they're the ones who actually got the work done. And you would have expected exactly the opposite of what we found, that they would have been paid more than the guys and promoted more. Instead, you had exactly the opposite. And that's one of the powers of statistics. You could say, you can say whatever you want, let's see what you actually do. And that's what the statistics showed us. Well, now here's the sad part of the story. Um, my youngest daughter was born at the end of uh, 1998. 
Uh, she has now lived her entire life where she has a memory with Walmart. I started working at Walmart in 1999, and let me show you what happened. Um, something's supposed to click here. It is not clicking. There we go. Okay, okay. Case was filed in June of 2001 after a year and a half of investigation. We filed a motion to certify the class after taking 200 depositions, getting all of Walmart's payroll data, and reviewing a million documents. And the hearing was in 2003, but the judge issued an 83-page order approving a class action in June of 2004. So far, so good. Walmart appealed. Click up there. Walmart. Well, Walmart appealed. We finally get to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals for reasons that have never been clear for me. Uh, it took several years to get our first opinion out of the Ninth Circuit. And then Walmart asked for a rehearing. That panel then took another big break uh, and issued a second panel decision. And then Walmart said, that's not enough. We want an in-bank decision where essentially instead of three judges, you get 11 judges. So we had an in-bank decision, and that decision came out in 2009. Walmart then appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. They filed what's called a petition for certiorari. There's the end bank decision was in 2010. Petition for cert was granted in December of 2010. We're getting into this year now. And the Supreme Court decision, I can't get this click to go here. For some reason it's not coming up. There we go. Whoop. Oral argument was in March, and the decision came out, um, came out in this summer in June. That's a very long time scale, 10 years. We were on appeal for six years, which is a very long period of time. And what's been happening during those last six years? And the answer is, I don't know. We haven't had any discovery for the last six years. We know what Walmart says in its PR stuff. Um, I know that since the class cert decision, in fact, two weeks afterwards, Walmart announced a, a one-time only equity pay adjustment where they raised women's ra wages somewhat. Uh, I know that they've started some sort of job posting for management trainee jobs, but there's some real questions about it. But we're on appeal, and the record going to the Supreme Court is the record below, not what might be happening outside. So Walmart goes to the Supreme Court, and there's two questions that are, that are raised. First question, which is what the Supreme Court added, was whether the class certification ordered under Rule 23b2 was consistent with Rule 23a. Don't worry, I'll explain what that means in a second. The second question is whether claims for monetary relief can be certified under Rule 23b2, and if so, under what circumstances. Okay, I am now going to give you the shortest history of class action in Title VII law you've ever heard in your life. Okay, in the beginning, prior to 1964, there was no national employment discrimination law. It was passed as part of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It was one of the mammoth things that passed Largely, people say, because uh, after John F. Kennedy was assassinated, um, Congress passed it sort of as a tribute to him, and it did things in many different fields, not just employment. There's housing, there's government programs, there's education, a lot of stuff. But the key uh, part of it was Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, which prohibited discrimination in employment uh, on the basis of race, gender, national origin, religion, etc. A later statute dealt with age, and a later statute dealt with disability. But the basic discrimination statute is Title VII. Now, there's a, there's a nasty little story about this. The original Title VII did not cover gender discrimination. A Southern senator, as a poison pill, because he thought it would make it laughable, amended the bill to add gender. And then, much to his surprise, the whole thing passed. So that was one of the weird, that's what the world was like in 1964. You might want to think about Mad Men and all the rest. This is the way people thought back in 1964. So that was kind of an, an evil motive. And then there was a, a level of naivety, which is astonishing. When Title VII was passed, Congress gave employers a one-year grace period on the assumption that they would all clean up their act within one year. Isn't that sweet? So, so a year goes by, and of course, everything is hunky-dory, right? Well, no. Every, every uh, uh, steel mill in the country uh, was, was race segregated. Uh, women were not getting paid equally. I mean, it was like terrible. But there was no mechanism other than filing an individual suit. So that's what brings us to class action law. And I'm going to go back to Title VII in a moment. Prior to 1966, when the modern law of class action was adopted, there was an old rule, an old rule uh, of class actions, which wasn't working very well. 
Uh, and so the uh, uh, people who write rules for the courts sat down and were trying to think, how can we make it better? And it was happening very much during the backdrop of the civil rights movement. So they came up with basically the idea that there would be some basic requirements for all kinds of class action. And the most important one for purposes of, of this is there has to be common issues, some glue that holds the case together in any class action. But the Rules Committee also said we're going to come have sort of like two different routes you can do to making a class. There's actually three, but I'm going to talk about two of them. One route, and they're thinking civil rights cases, it would be a simple, swift way to get a class certified for cases where you want to change government or private conduct through an injunction or declaratory relief. And they were thinking about, you know, the uh, integration of, of bus systems and getting fed at lunch counters and uh, getting fair, fair employment in different places. That's very much was on their mind when, when they passed this. So they made that the simplest, easiest thing to get certified. On the other hand, they said, well, if you're mainly about money, about getting money in the U.S. justice system, we have a preference for personal litigation. So we're going to set up a, a more demanding rule if you were mainly about money. And that more demanding rule requires not only that there be common questions, but that common questions predominate over individual questions. And before you can try one of those cases, you have to give notice to people and a right of them to opt out of the lawsuit. You've all seen those crab little things in the newspaper, opt-out rights and all the rest. That's when it's mainly about money. So that was what was adopted back there. So the first type, the injunctive relief kind of case, is Rule 23b-2. And the money kind of case is Rule 23b-3. Let me go back to Title VII, kind of sort of tie these together. The early cases under Title VII said there are two ways you can prove discrimination. One way which is old-fashioned intentional discrimination they call disparate treatment. You treat you know, the women different from the men, the, the blacks different from the whites, and it's intentional. The other theory is called adverse impact, and that's a theory that basically says you may not intend it, but you have a policy that has the effect of treating men and women differently. And if you have that, you're going to be treated as a discriminator unless there's a good business reason for that policy. So you have these two different theories that are back there. The early courts said that discrimination cases were almost inherently class action cases, and they just would say, we'll treat them all as class action cases. They also said that the main kind of money you could get in a Title VII case, which back then was limited to lost wages, was very consistent with injunctive relief. So we're going to treat all Title VII cases under this easier Rule 23b2 provision. That was the early history. Come to the present. Uh, the first part, that civil rights cases automatically get certified, the Supreme Court said that's no good in 1982. You have to prove that you meet the requirements of Rule 23. But the second part, the assumption that back pay or lost wages was consistent with the easier certification was true in virtually every circuit up until this summer when the Supreme Court ruled in the Dukes versus Walmart. So there will be an exam tomorrow on all this. So remember all that. That's your very short history. Now let me talk about what the Supreme Court actually did in our case and what, what the evidence showed. So Rule 23A are the requirements that applies in every class action case. The most important of one is commonality. You also have to show that there's enough class members, it's called numerosity, that the plaintiffs have claims that are similar enough to the class uh, and that they're adequate representatives. But the Supreme Court just talked about this commonality standard. So, first thing they said was commonality means not just that there's some common questions in the case, but that there has to be a common answer, that there's a way of resolving this case that would apply across the board. So that's the first thing they said. That didn't bother me particularly. I could live with that. You know, we thought we had some common answers that could, the question was, is there discrimination? And we thought uh, that there are ways of showing that. And they said, well, you have to have something that somehow this is not doing that. That, that, that the proof that you offer, offer is central to the validity of the case and, and central to class resolution. Now, this was a little different. In the past, the courts had said that showing a common issue, any common issue would do. The Supreme Court has definitely raised how much proof has to be brought. You can't just allege 
that there's a problem, you have to show evidence of that. Uh, and not only that, that you, it's all right for the court to sort of take a peek behind the evidence to see even where it overlaps with the ultimate merits question about whether there is liability or not. Now, all that stuff was kind of what was going on out in the world in the last couple of years. None of that was particularly uh, significant or startling to, to, to me or, the, or most of the plaintiff's class action lawyers. What was startling was they came up with a new rule that applied solely to discrimination cases. That is, in, a, in order to get the class certified, not to go to trial, but to get the class treated so you can go to trial as a class action, the plaintiffs had to have what the court described as significant proof of a general policy of discrimination. Now, this, this is language they drew from a footnote that was talking about a different context, but this is a, a brand new generalized requirement. So some immediate questions come up. In our case, we were challenging in part the fact that there was no policy, that there was subjective standards. So are subjective standards something that could be covered from this? Is this significant proof requirement any different than what we'd have to prove if we go to trial? Um, and what about the weight given to the fact that Walmart, like every other company in the world, has a piece of paper that says we're against discrimination? What weight is given to that also? So that was sort of the, 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 the starting mindset of the court. So how what they actually do? The court looked at what it described as the evidence. And I have to step back and, and offer a briefly snarky comment here. Um, when people ask me, how do, you, how do you interpret or read the Dukes versus Walmart decision, what I say is you have to look at it as if it's its own universe within its four walls because it actually bears very little relationship to either the evidence in this case or the law that existed prior to its decision. So you look at it as a hermetically sealed thing. So I'm going to describe what the Supreme Court said the evidence was in this case. So the first thing they said is they uh, looked at the size of the case and, and what it described as our, our theory. Uh, it then kind of mushed together the different Title VII theories of liability, adverse impact and disparate treatment, without very much uh, distinction. Um, and it then kind of offered sort of a caricature of what the actual evidence is. So that's where we start out. So let me tell you how, what, how they actually describe the evidence. If I can make this turn. There we go. First type of evidence. There were three categories according to the Supreme Court. First was anecdotal evidence. What's anecdotal evidence? Anecdotal evidence is where an individual says, my manager said I'm not going to pay you because you're not a man. And that's an anecdote which also evidence that might suggest a common issue. The Supreme Court said, well, you only had 115 declarations from women. This company is millions of people, so you should have a lot more, so we're just going to ignore that, despite the fact that this evidence often was of high-level managers making those statements. So they ignored the anecdotal evidence. Statistical proof. Basically, it said that where you have um, a big company, uh, that you have to have your statistics at, quote, the level of the decision maker. Now. That's fine. Our view was the region was, was the place where decisions were making. The Supreme Court assumed and based its decision on the assumption that, in fact, the decisions were all made at the store level. So essentially, it described this case as involving 4,000 independent strangers, uh, 4,000 different fifes, and that, so therefore, you should have statistics at each level. Uh, final thing is it described what it called social science. Uh, we argued and offered uh, a lot of evidence, actually the last 30 or 40 years of, of, of psychosociological research, that where you have a non-system, where you have an excessive reliance of subjective criteria and an unbalanced workforce, there is a great risk that conscious and unconscious bias will seep into your system. There's nothing novel about this. This is pretty well-established stuff. Uh, what the Supreme Court seized on was the fact that our experts said quite reasonably, uh, in answer to the question, well, what percentage of the decisions are going to be based on this conscious or unconscious bias? He says, I can't tell you that. That's not what, I can tell you that this system is prone to it, which we thought raised a common question. I can't give you a mathematical probability. Go talk to the statistician. The Supreme Court said because he couldn't give that figure, he will give that evidence zero weight. So. 
What is really the premise? Here is really the premise. Good old Scalia. Okay, I got to tell you another Starkey story. The morning of the argument, and I only found this out later, the morning of the oral argument, Anton Scalia was in a car accident. And he was given a ticket for that car accident. He ran a red light. So he got to court loaded for bear. And of course, we were the bear that got loaded that day. And he made a comment, which, which I only later realized, you know, w w totally made sense. He, he said that one of our arguments was, this is giving me whiplash, he said. Where was the whiplash from? It wasn't from us. He got confused. Anyway. <laughs> so here's really the heart of his decision. It's right here. His assumption, ignoring the evidence in the case, ignoring uh, empirical science, and applying Professor Scalia on human interaction. Left to their own devices, most managers in any corporation, and surely most managers in a corporation that forbids sex discrimination, remember that piece of paper, would select sex-neutral performance-based criteria for hiring and promotion to produce actionable, uh, uh, that produce actual disparity. It is quite unbelievable that all managers would exercise their discretion in a common way without some common direction. That is really the heart of where he's coming from. Now, I have to take the long view here. When Title VII was passed, it was passed with exactly the opposite assumption that, in fact, in the heavily race-segregated and gender-segregated occupations, the assumption was, left to their own devices, managers were discriminating. And, and, and so there was a burden put on them to justify their actions. But that's not what uh, Justice Scalia thought was important. So that's the heart of it. Um, let me, if I can get the page to turn, give you the very specifics quickly of the decision, the more technical stuff. Um, the court, on the first issue, commonality, I'm sorry, I'm going to go to the second issue. Commonality, they rejected it, ultimately simply saying there is no commonality because of this assumption that all managers are going to do different things. So it's not a common question. The second part of their opinion was interesting. Remember that difference between B2 and B3? Prior to uh, the summer of 2011, every court, every circuit had ruled that lost pay uh, was consistent with Rule 23B2, the simpler way of, of establishing these cases. This court, 9-0, and shame on the liberals on this court, uh, adopted a rule that was stricter than any previous circuit and held that basically monetary relief of any sort has to be viewed under the much stricter rule of Rule 23b3. It's a much heavier burden of establishing it. So back pay couldn't be certified under b2. Moreover, it said that you have to prove back pay on a person by person basis, that the employer is entitled essentially to, have, to challenge every member of the class to say you're not entitled to back pay. We had argued that when you have a policy like this where there's no records, where there's no objective standards, that the way you should do this is essentially use statistical analysis like a multiple regression to figure out who is entitled to pay. The Supreme Court said that's no good. We're gonna, that Title VII says that you have, that the employer has the right to contact contest every individual decision. It's a brand new decision by the Supreme Court. In the last 40 years, no other court had said that. And it rejected the concept of trial by formula. So, I want to give Ginsburg three seconds of, of credit here. She has the opposite ideological view for the Supreme Court. The idea of delegating to supervisors is an easy way of perpetuating stereotypes. She dissented from the first part of the case, but not from the second part of this case. I'm going to move forward because I want to get to the, the real juice here. You know, the, after 10 years of litigating this case, it was not a good day to get that decision, I have to tell you. Uh, it wasn't the end of it, and I, I, I will digress. When we walked out of oral argument, uh, Walmart, we let Walmart go out first. Oral argument was brutal. It was terrible. You know, Scalia throwing this crap at us, his whiplash and all the rest. Uh, we go out, Walmart's talking to the press. There were hundreds of demonstrators outside. Uh, demonstrating against Walmart and against unequal pay. And it was a lovely thing to see because all of the suits for Walmart were totally terrified because all these signs, equal pay, and all the rest. Uh, so uh, we came out feeling much better knowing that there was some support out there. And our plaintiffs, uh, they were all asked, uh, do you feel like you, you're, you're a loser? She says, as Betty Duke said, as Chris Klobdowski, as our other plaintiffs said, no, we're winners. 
because we've been able to challenge this company and bring them all the way to the Supreme Court. And as I'll tell you in a moment, the case is not over. But it laid some new markers down. And the question is, how bad is this decision and what are its implications? And there's different ways you can read this decision, of course. First of all, you could say, well, this is a, 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 an anomalous decision. It's only about a case involving an enormous company with a lot of job positions and no, and no clear standards involving decentralized decision making. Um, and so therefore, since there's no other case that looks exactly like that, maybe this doesn't apply. That's sort of the glass is half full kind of, kind of view on it. Um, on the other hand, judges at all level may look at this decision and, and take the evident hostility the court had towards class actions and apply that across the board to all class cases and say there's a new feeling in the world. Uh, and you're wondering, what is AT&T doing up there? Well, that's the other piece of the puzzle. This term, the Supreme Court issued not one, but two very bad class action decisions. The other is a case called Concepcion versus AT&T. Very technical decision that's going to affect every one of you. What it says is that under the Federal Arbitration Act, when a company, in that case, uh, uh, AT&T, has a policy that says anybody has a dispute with us has to go to mandatory arbitration, but that arbitration will not allow you to bring a class action. The Supreme Court said that's a good policy, and it preempts any state law to the contrary. Basically, what it says is consumers, where there's this kind of agreement unilaterally imposed by a company, lose the right to bring class actions. Employers are trying to do the same thing. So if you take AT&T and Walmart together, it was a very, very bad year for class action cases. So how do we react to it? And we mean people trying to vindicate the rights of our clients. What kinds of steps can we do? So there's a number of things we've thought about and how we can read it. Of course, the first thing is to confine this case to its facts and say, of course, my new case I'm filing, the defendant's uh, name doesn't start with W, so a you know, Walmart case doesn't apply. You can try those arguments. You don't get real far. Uh, but one immediate implication is you're not going to see very many very large national class actions anymore. Uh, one thing that I underestimated all along was the sheer effect of size. Um, I always describe Walmart, and I still believe it's true, as really a very garden variety case of old-fashioned badness. It just happened to be done on a very, very large scale. Well, scale does have matter. That's why the appeal was taken by the Ninth Circuit, and I think that's why the Supreme Court took it. Um, the talk about statistics being tailored to the decision maker, uh, that also is a hint that smaller cases involving um, more regional or local kinds of decisions. Now, the, the good news is those cases might survive. The bad news is if you have a company that's evil in every way, you can only go after one piece at a time, which raises the transaction costs and lowers the deterrent effect of these cases. The Supreme Court made it raise the bar about how much evidence you need to have to certify a class. So you're going to have cases that are going to get more expensive, more discovery before class certification. We did a lot. We did a year and a half of very intensive discovery, and arguably, we should have done more under this new standard, um, which of course means these cases are going to be even more expensive. Uh, as of the date the judge certified our class in 2004, our out-of-pocket expenses were two and a half million dollars in this case, and that's for experts, depositions, travel, documents, etc. It's not the attorneys. You know, the attorney's time in this case was many, many times more, of course. No one was paying for that. We didn't have uh, out-of-pocket on that one. Um, that's RIP. Remember, rest in peace. Modern science, uh, social science doesn't exist anymore. Um, that whole theory of all the research in the last 40 years and the implicit bias into how people make decisions, Scalia essentially said, I don't care about that one way or the other. So the question is, what theories are going to work? And it's like, not back to the future, but return to the past. Essentially, the theories that, re, that are undisturbed by that decision are the oldest theories of, Walmart, of, of uh, Title VII. Uh, traditional adverse impact cases, particularly those where you can specifically identify um, an education requirement, a height requirement, a physical requirement, those are untouched by Walmart. Traditional, what are called pattern or practice cases, was where you can show 
uh, systemic overt discrimination across the board. That doesn't appear to have been touched by Walmart. What Walmart specifically seems to throw out, despite earlier Supreme Court cases, is challenges to subjective decision making. Um, and, and there's very hard to imagine how you can do that at this point. The other thing the court didn't look at is some strategic um, uses of Rule 23. And this gets kind of technical, but there's, there are different provisions of, of Rule 23, the class action rule, that says you can have partial classes on specific issues uh, instead of a whole class. It may not be possible to do back pay hearings for a million employees, but maybe you could have a partial class certified solely to determine liability. And if you determine that a company has a pattern or practice of discrimination, those million women or million African Americans or whatever the protected group is can go to court with a favorable burden of proof when they go to court now and wrapped around with that class action decision. So some, some techniques that one might want to look at. Um, what is the effect of this decision outside of Title VII? Well, within literally minutes, if not well, maybe a day, of the decision, uh, defendants in class actions, actions of every sort filed motions for reconsideration and basically they would cite Dukes versus Walmart for the proposition that plaintiffs should now lose. Uh, and they tried it everywhere. I mean, it's amazing. And I've, I've read a whole bunch of decisions. Um, and they've tried it in Fair Labor Standards Act overtime cases. They've tried it in consumer cases. They've tried it in environmental cases. Every kind of case that's there. And the decisions are starting to come out from district courts, and we've had one or two uh, circuit court decisions that have come out so far. Um, what these decisions show is that there is a fair amount of resistance to taking the more draconian parts of Walmart outside of, out of the sort of subjective criteria kind of case. Most cases involving the Federal Fair Labor Standards Act say Walmart doesn't apply at all because it has its own procedure. It doesn't have a class action procedure. It has an opt-in procedure with different rules. Uh, even under Title VII, challenges that are not based on subjective criteria, most other courts have said, well, Walmart doesn't automatically apply. What does automatically apply, and is actually, ironically, the most significant change, is the requirement that whenever you seek damages, you are automatically in the more heightened standard, Rule 23b3. And that does apply across the board, which makes it much harder to seek monetary relief in anything but the smallest classes when all the people are, are there and you can talk to them. Final piece of Walmart, which is really the most disturbing in, in some ways. Any of you had appellate procedure or civil procedure? You know what the standard for appeal is when, when things go up on appeal? It's not de novo. You're not supposed to redo it, right? You're supposed to defer to the findings of the trial judge, and only if a decision is without substantial evidence or clearly erroneous, the Supreme Court ignored literally did not cite a single finding from the district court, 83-page opinion. It ignored every factual finding uh, and just made its own decision. Uh, and other courts, uh, particularly if you have a result in mind, are going to do the same thing. Other piece of it is there'll be more individual cases because there's less class cases. The one advantage of a class case is it allows people um, to rely on a systemic approach. Now those people are going to have to file individual cases. So, what happens in Dukes versus Walmart? Contrary to newspaper reports, the Supreme Court decision did not dismiss our case. It said, this class is no good. Now, it had a couple of interesting effects. Based on older Supreme Court rules, as long as a class action is pending, up until the day a court says it no longer exists, the statute of limitations for every class member is told. So we have women who have claims going back to 1998 who today can file lawsuits going back to 1998. And you know what? They are going to. Uh, we've interviewed 12,000 women, and we're working on filing EEOC charges and lawsuits for those women around the country. Uh, second implication, and this is a little bit more challenging, uh, we think that there is a good argument that, that we can bring smaller class cases around the country based on a different legal theory and more tailored evidence to avoid some of the strictures of, of Walmart. Now, there's a legal impediment here, a challenge. There's some old cases saying that this tolling rule does not apply to class actions. It only applies to individual cases. And we think there's some arguments to change that. We'll see what happens. But 
most immediately, you, when you pick up your newspaper on October 29th this month, you will see that in California, uh, in the Northern District where Dukes versus Walmart is pending, a motion to amend the complaint was filed to bring the next generation of Dukes versus Walmart, still with Betty Dukes um, as the plaintiff. And let me tell you what happened to Betty Dukes. Betty Dukes, who still goes, works five days a week at Pittsburgh as a greeter, um, one month before the defendant's class cert brief was due in 2003, her manager called her in and told her she was getting the largest pay raise of her life, a 50% raise in pay. And the reason she got that was Walmart in their brief could say that Betty Duke's pay is not less than the average of her store. Uh, Chris Krubnowski, another of our plaintiffs who still works at a Sam's Club, uh, got promoted into management trainee a month before that motion. And as Betty put it, I guess I've benefited from this litigation to this day. Uh, but she's still working at Walmart and uh, still uh, very dedicated to this case going forward. So that's my short version. Oh, last thing, outside the box. I'm sorry. This is the most important thing at all. What do we do now? How are we going to do with this terrible Supreme Court? There's three things. There's, there are bills being considered in Congress, which probably aren't going to go anywhere until there's a change in the makeup of, of the House of Representatives. The most important single thing are judicial appointments. And I, I mentioned the Fourth Circuit example. Now, what is that? Fourth Circuit, which is in the border south, uh, up until fairly recently was the most conservative circuit in the country. They were absolutely terrible on discrimination cases. It is flipped now. Uh, the president has made enough appointees where the Fourth Circuit is now a majority Democratic circuit, and it actually is now one of the most liberal circuits. What happens? First thing they did after the first appointment is they decided a Title VII case against the new core uh, corporation, which reads like it was written in the first day of Title VII. So judicial appointments make an enormous difference. And then there's guerrilla litigation. Now, I don't mean necessarily, you know, taking to the mountains with Che and you know, enticing them to come up at you and you no, that's not what I mean. What it means is being strategic and thinking about what makes the biggest impact and not thinking in a courtroom, but thinking about how do you use media, how do you use grassroots organizations, how do you use protests, how do you use uh, litigation as a way to, to drive uh, uh, an overall strategy. And that's what I call guerrilla litigation. Uh, and that's what we're doing in Walmart. You know, we couldn't, we couldn't go at them with our own army. So now we're going to break up into a lot of small uh, guerrilla bands, and we're going to make their life uh, as much as possible living hell uh, until they come to the table and talk to us. Um, I, I said that uh, I, I take an optimistic view of the world, um, and I'm optimistic in the long run, but I guess the other piece is, is how you, you deal with, with, uh, with anger also. In my view, Walmart is one of the most arrogant companies in the world, and um, my view and the view of, of the plaintiffs and the other people is we'll be damned if we're going to walk away from this. So that's the Walmart case, and I'd be happy to take any questions you all have. Yeah? Um, what is your view of the implications of the Duke's decision on EEOC having a practice for class Okay, this is asked by the regional attorney for the EOC here, so is looking for some, some guidance. Yeah, they don't have to, have to deal with the commonality questions and the like. Um, the question is whether the Supreme Court was also saying something about the substantive law, particularly how do you prove a pattern of practice case. I think there's two implications. The first is um, I think even the EEOC may have a chal challenging time on a subjective criteria case purely, um, although the Supreme Court describe that challenge as mainly a commonality rule 23. Um, but the harder part for the EEOC is more on the remedy part. You know, we used to assume, and the case law was clear, that where you had a non-system with no standards and no records, that you could, uh, once you establish liability, you could determine damages through statistical means. You know, and that way you could give relief to a lot of people. The Supreme Court, although they were talking about rule 23, uh, also talked about Title VII substantive right and said that employers have an, a right under Title VII to challenge uh, every single individual and suggesting that that formula approach would not work. 
which I think is going to raise some of the administrative burdens. The EEOC won't be able to use formula either. Now, there's arguments, and I, I'll, I'll make them uh, about why that may or may not apply, but I think that that may ultimately be the uh, most challenging part of the decision, which, which would raise the administrative uh, challenges in larger cases for the EEOC, just as it does for us bringing uh, class action cases. Any other questions? Yeah. <coughs> Is it accurate to say that a rational company with a large mix uh, workforce would be best off to have a totally decentralized employment practice and, and uh, have no criteria passed down to the individual Well, no, because that's not how companies work. And this is, this is the Walmart example. Uh, you know, I think the fear that companies are all going to sort of dismantle all their reporting systems, that's not going to happen because companies succeed because they set goals and they have management. And Walmart, they do this in every aspect of their employment. They're not going to suddenly decentralize everything. What they will do, every company will make sure they have a very big piece of paper that says we do not discriminate. Uh, and every company will mush the standards on, on, on uh, employment to some extent. But they're not going to stop doing what makes companies successful, which is having a command and control system. Because uh, that's not good for business. And that's been my argument all along about one of the strongest arguments for affirmative action goals, for example, is that's consistent with how business does anything. You don't get anything done unless you set a goal. And if the goal can't be quantified, it's a meaningless goal. Uh, that's how companies generally operate. So I don't think they're going to dismantle those systems. They're going to try to use the fig leaf of an of a, uh, anti-discrimination policy as some kind of a defense. Yeah? So, okay. In Walmart, It'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, there's been um, uh, only one decision I know that's addressed a Bilby-like opinion since the Walmart. It deals with another expert, which actually was another expert in the Walmart case, Mark Bendick, uh, in which one court said that uh, his evidence about stereotyping was not per se invalid with regard to liability. Uh, uh, it had some other issues and limited them in other ways. I think it makes it much harder, though. Uh, you know, the, the, what we thought the utility of the social science at the class certification hearing was showing that there was a common question raised by that system, whether it was prone to be being infected by bias. And the Supreme Court basically said, we're not going to treat it as a common question unless he can quantify exactly how much that would be, which is an impossible standard. Other questions? Yeah. I'm sorry. Did you do a test before filing class Against Walmart, no. Uh, Walmart has a reputation well earned of never settling anything. So a test case would basically have gone on for 10 years and not accomplished anything. Um, you know, in some cases, I try to settle cases before I file them. In some cases, I don't. With Walmart, it was obvious that was never going to go anywhere. I have cases, though, where I try to settle, and they still don't go anywhere uh, against other companies. And sometimes I settle cases. Uh, beforehand, but a test case, uh, you know, to be to make a difference, uh, has got to actually cost something to the employer, uh, and it's enough to make them want to settle a case. So I think we had to go for the whole thing. Yeah. Traditionally, commonality really dealt specifically with common questions, and you said the the court in in Walmart sort of changed that to. to the commonality required common answers. How significant do you think that change is going to be? Well, on a semantic basis, it doesn't mean anything. But what I think trial judges are going to read that as saying is that even for these swift, easy Rule 23b2 injunctive class actions, that there is a very high commonality requirement. Uh, that, that there is a, an issue that's really central to the litigation. That didn't used to be the rule. So I think it generally is going to raise the bar for the non-damages kinds of cases. The bar is already high for damage cases. 
but the Supreme Court seems to have taken it from here to here and, and made it harder across the board. Other? Oh. Thank you very much.